those together. So we finished up with that series, and I, I was looking at a new series I wanted to do, and, and, and I got to thinking, and I got to looking at, at discipleship. We have, we've done several studies on Wednesday nights on discipleship, but I've never really done a, a Sunday morning series on what it really means to be a disciple. Well, I want to look at what does, what does it mean to be a disciple? How do you become a disciple? What does it take to be a disciple? And then what's a disciple supposed to look like? What is a disciple supposed to to do? You see, when we think about disciples, a lot of people, when we mention disciples, we think of the 12 disciples. Well, those were the, and later on, as you get into the book of Acts, as we've been studying, those are called the apostles. Anybody who is a follower of Jesus, a true follower, is considered a disciple. But here's the problem. The majority of our Christians and a majority of church members and a majority of people who call themselves Christians are not true disciples. They, uh, they, they are not what, what a disciple really should be. And that's why I want to do a study here on disciples to help us to, to see where we where we need to improve, where we need to be uh, as, as Christians and disciples. See, I like the name disciple better than Christian because Christian has become so overused. Uh, used to, you'd ask people if they're a Christian, they'd say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm an American. Or, uh, yeah, my, my mama was a, uh, went to church all of her life. My, my granddaddy was a preacher, and I hear that all the time. And people classify themselves as Christians if they've been baptized. They classify themselves as Christians if they went to VBS 20 years ago and and made a statement there. And we want to look at this and and realize that that's not, number one, it's not what makes you a Christian, but even more, it is not what makes you a disciple. And all of our goals should be about becoming a disciple, not just calling ourselves a Christian, not just not just looking at, at what it, you know, Christian actually means to be Christ-like. But we have, been, we have been distorted to where we were first called a Christian nation, so people felt like if you was from America, you were a Christian. To, to, then we had a president who said we were no longer a Christian nation. And when you look at the statistics, we are not a Christian nation. Now, but Christianity is still the... Uh, it's still the, the, the largest of, the, of the, the faiths in America. But we, are, we have so many other faiths now that uh, it's not considered a Christian nation because more than, more than 50% of the nation is not Christians. And, and therefore... The name Christian, I think, has, has been overused. And that's why I want us to look at what does it mean to be called a disciple. Because that's how I want to be known. Not just as a Christian, but I want to be known as a disciple. So we look at today, we're going to look at the call. We're going to look at being called to be a disciple. And we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 4 and in verse 19. And we're going to see here the first four disciples that Jesus called. We're going to look at how he called them. We're going to look at, w- at why he called them. We're going to look at what they did when he called them. And we're going to look at what we should do in relation. Verse 19 of chapter 4 of Matthew, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now we see this, and we see what they did. We see the way that, that things happened. We see that, 
that uh, they are here in their boats. And think about this. These are men on the job. These are men who are out there, and this is their livelihood. Now, I've heard people tell me, I've heard people tell me in the past, and I was brought up this way, that your job was the most important thing. That's what sustained you. That's what kept you going. That's what, you know, people would let you down, but now your job, you're, and I was taught that my whole life. Here we see these four men who were out on their job, and we see others of the disciples who were on their job. And, and they were, they, this was their livelihood, not just their livelihood, but they were on the boat with their fathers. It was their father's livelihood. It was their whole family's livelihood. This is how they, they provided for their family. Now, these, these guys were probably older teenagers, it's, it's believed. They were probably youth, maybe even in their 20s, but they were younger guys. We know that because of how long they lived after Jesus died. They, uh, some of them lived quite a while. And, and you know, so we, we believe they were younger, um, but, you know, we don't really know that for sure that all of them were. But we see them out here. And when the call came, it's left. They left it all. I want to look at this. The initiation came from Jesus. He was the one who came and called them. He's the one who came and said, follow me. He didn't, just, he didn't wait for them to come to him. He goes to them. And let me tell you something. I believe, I believe wholeheartedly that everybody, and I know this goes against some other thinkings and some other theologies, but I believe that Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, calls everybody at least once. I believe that everybody gets that opportunity. I believe we're all called to follow him. But this, this demonstrates his authority. This had demonstrated his, his, his sovereignty, that he calls disciples. Now, the thing is, is these guys already knew who Jesus was. They already had shown interest in Jesus. They, they knew who he was, so this wasn't just some random guy. Cause if some just, now, if they're out here on a boat and some random guy walks by and says, follow me, and they followed him, then they would be a little bit, It'd be something a little odd about that. There, there are people, they call that cults, and people do it all the time. But no, they already knew who Jesus was. Jesus was already, Jesus was already becoming popular. And we know that at least, at least some of them knew who he was, because you go to John chapter 1, and... And in verse 35 through 39, it says, Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So John had pointed him out. John recognized who he was. I've heard people, I've had that question asked. Did John really know who Jesus was? Absolutely. Because as he walks by, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. He pointed him out to his disciples. And he said, Two, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, seeing them following him, and said, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Now we know that Peter was one of them. One of those. And Andrew was one of them. We know that. Now we don't know who else was there. We just uh, There was two. And, but, but then they went and found others. And brought them. Brought Nathaniel. And, and we see that he brings these. And they, they, they come and they, they are seeking Jesus. So this is another thing that we see about disciples. They came, they initiated, they came and they wanted to know more about Jesus. But guess what? Just because they came, they had a desire to know more. They did not become disciples at that point. There's a lot of people have come to church seeking an answer. There's a lot of people that have come to church or come to Christians and come and ask questions. There's people that have problems going on in their lives. They have things going on. And, and I've seen, I don't know how many times we see people and we 
We've had people show up at church and, they, and they've got issues, they've got problems, they've got things going on and they don't know where the answers are and they come here looking for answers. They get the call, they hear the gospel and they still walk out. Just because they came looking didn't mean that they, didn't mean that they answered the call. But we see here that they came, they looked for Jesus, they knew who He was, they had been taught who He was, they understood who He was. But you can't make the decision to be a disciple of Jesus. You can't make that decision to be a follower all on your own. You have to be drawn by Him. You have to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. Here are these men who came. They found out who He was. John pointed out who He was. They knew who He was. That is our job. That is what John's job was, was a proclaimer. Folks, we think of you, think of us, as John the Baptist. We need to be doing exactly what John the Baptist did. We need, to be, we need to be meeting people. And we need to be pointing out, Behold the Lamb of God. We need to be telling people about Jesus. Now we can't draw them. We can't call them. We can't save them. But we need to be pointing them out. Had they not been introduced to Jesus, had had John not pointed out who they were, they wouldn't have followed him. They wouldn't have went and, and sought him. And then when he came along, they wouldn't have got the call. They wouldn't have followed him. They wouldn't have known who he, they wouldn't have known who he was. They wouldn't have known what that call meant. I've seen that before too. I've, 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 talked, I've told you all about the guy that I talked to. that He said he went to church and he started sweating and his heart started beating, but he didn't know what it was. He thought he was having a heart attack. And he left and never been back. You see, we need to make the introduction. We need to, to introduce people to Jesus so that when He calls, they know who He is. It's not some random call. It's not just something random, but we need to be pointing them out. You see, Jesus had many people who followed Him. You, the twelve disciples were not the only disciples. We know that from the book of Acts. When we look in the book of Acts and we study the, the book of Acts as we went to chapter 1, we saw that on the, at the upper room where, where Matthias was picked to be the twelfth disciple. We know that there was many that they were choosing from, many names that were brought up before they, before they decided on Matthias. And it said these were people who had been with him since the baptism. We know that at many times there was as many as 200 people followed him all the time. Now there was the, the, the 12 inner group, and then there was even the smaller inner group of three. But there was many, many disciples that he had called to follow him. But then we see also that there was this group that followed him for what they could get. They followed him because they knew who he was. But they never answered the call. You see, in John chapter 6, we see some of those. This was, this was after he fed the 5,000. And Jesus got in the boat and went to the other side of the... Uh, or actually, the disciples got in the boat and left. And then Jesus walked on the water to get out there to them. And, and when the people woke up the next morning, they saw that he wasn't there. And they saw that the boat was gone. And they scrambled to get over to Capernaum. And that's where we see in John chapter 6, they followed him and they found him while he was in Capernaum. And it said, they came to him and they, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of God will give you, because God the Father has set His seal upon Him. You see, here are these people who were following Him, but they weren't disciples. They were following Him, they were just following along light behind so that they get some bread, so that they get some fish, so that they would, so they just get something. And that, after they, He told them this, they said, well, well, Moses gave food to our forefathers. And Jesus said, no, it wasn't Moses who gave it to him. It was God that gave it to him. And then he said, I am the bread of life. But he tells them here that you know, you're not seeking me because of the signs. You're not seeking me because of who I am. You're seeking me for what you can get. You see, following Jesus because 
of salvation is not being a disciple. You see, we're told that we can have salvation. Jesus, and, and, and so many people who call themselves Christians, so many people who follow, they're like these people that are just looking for bread. They're just looking for salvation. And I, I've heard preachers call it before. We're not just, you shouldn't just be looking for fire insurance. Okay, we need to be looking for that relationship. We need to be looking to become a disciple. We need to be looking to, to be more than just a, just, just, a, just a Christian, just somebody who calls themselves a Christian for what we get out of it. Now, yeah, li listen, salvation is wonderful. Not having to worry about about yourself and not having to worry about the afterlife. But here's the problem. So many people came and made a profession. And so many people have come and, and, and been baptized. And they think they're all right. Billy Graham made this statement one time. And I don't know how true, how, how true it is. But he said he believed that 85% of our churches. The people in our churches are lost. Because they haven't become disciples. You see, Jesus gives an invitation to follow. When he said, follow me, he's, when he said, come, follow me, it was not an invitation to just get behind him. It wasn't just an invitation to, to walk along with him. It was an invitation to become part of him. So today when he calls us and he says, follow me, when he says, come unto me, he's not just saying, come and get your salvation. He's saying, come and be a part of what I am. Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. It says, and when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus says to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the be dead bury their own dead. This sounds harsh. This sounds uncaring. But Jesus is not being uncaring in this. Let me tell you what Jesus is saying. I am first. I need to be first. I want to be first in your life. I want to be above your job. I want to be above your family. I want to be above your comfort. I want to be above your house. I want to be number one. I want to be number one in your life. I want to be number one in your heart. You see, that's what we are supposed to be. Now, now next week we're going to cover this a little bit better, a little bit deeper. But like I said, this is not just a call for salvation. It is a call to repentance. It is a call to follow Him. Now, I remember the game. How many of y'all remember the game, Follow the Leader? Now, Follow the Leader in school, I remember, or in, 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 when we was little, I, I remember one time my dad had, <laughs> he had, he had, Put cross ties, old cross ties. You know, you used to just get cross ties for free. Uh, if you knew somebody worked at the railroad or the railroad, you could get them all the time. And, and he had lined our whole yard with cross ties. And my birthday party, I was probably about six or seven years old. We had a big party. It was in June. Everybody's there. You know, I, no, none of us wearing shoes. Most of us not in shirts. Just you know, playing around, and, and we played follow the leader, and, and we walked on them cross ties. And Mom picked splinters out of my feet for a week after that. 
But when you played follow the leader, you know, if, if, one follow, if one walked like this, everybody had to walk like that. If one walked like this, everybody had to walk like that. If, everybody, if somebody hopped on one foot, everybody had to walk on one foot. You see, the thing is, if, you, if, if they were walking like this and you just walked normal, you wasn't following the leader, you was out. You see, that was the thing, you had to follow the leader. You, what, you, you, to follow the leader, you didn't just walk the way you wanted to walk. So when Jesus says, follow me, he's the leader. He's not just saying, follow me and walk however you want to. He's not saying, follow me and do your own thing. Because that's not following him. That's just walking in the same direction. See, we need to follow him. When he does good for people, we need to do good for people. When he shows love to people, we need to show love to people. When he shows grace to people, we need to show grace to people. When he lived a perfect life, we need to try to live a perfect life. You see, it's not just doing what we want to do. That does not make you a disciple because that is not following him. That's just making, that's, that's just making a statement. That's just saying it in your mind or even with your mouth, which means absolutely nothing. You see, we need to have a better understanding, I think. In order to be true disciples, we need, to, we need to get into the Word well enough to know what Jesus really was like. We, we, we see so many legalistic people. We see so many people that are so judgmental. And we see so many people that, that are quick to judge and quick to put people down and quick to push people aside. And we see people who are, are so quick to do these things. And that's not how Jesus did but we also had to be careful that we're not just accepting of everything because Jesus accepted everybody, but he didn't accept their ways. And there's a fine line there, but when we, when we are true followers of Jesus, I believe that we'll get, when we get in line, we'll have a better understanding of how that's supposed to look. So many people, we get, we get our, our views, our ideas, and we get our ideas mixed up I've heard people, uh, knew a guy one time that he was talking about, I forget what he was talking about, but he was talking about, well, this is the scripture that I use for that, to, to, to tell people they should do this. And I heard somebody the other day, uh, this clip of somebody preaching on, on men with beards. I remember that when I was a kid, we had a, we had a preacher that pre got on beards. And, and it said it was vanity and, and, and hiding something and all kinds of stuff. Let me tell you something, that's not in the Scripture. And they would take Scripture and twist it. And, and, and this one guy commented, he said, stay in the Scripture. Don't try to make Scripture fit your personal opinion. And a lot of people do that. They, take, they try to take the Scripture. Listen, we need to know what Jesus did. We need to know how Jesus reacted. We need to know what he felt like. And then when we do that, we need to stay in the Scripture well enough to where we know who he is so that we can mimic it. I don't want anybody to follow me. I don't want anybody to follow, you know, I don't want to live like Peter. Peter's a good example, but I don't want to be like Peter. Paul's a good example, but I don't want to be like Paul. It's like, because if you try to be like Paul, or you try to be like Peter, let me tell you something, Paul had flaws. Paul said, among sinners I am chief. Peter had flaws. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. It becomes like the old, the old game telephone, where you, you pass down, a, a, or gossip, however, whatever you called it, but you, you pass along something, it, it gets distorted. And when you follow my life, or you follow their life, or you follow somebody else's life, you're going to get distorted. Go back to the source. Just like when you're, when you're, when you're building a, a, a deck, or you're building something, and you're cutting, you're, you're cutting examples, you, you get a pattern. And you always cut to that same pattern. Because if you cut this one to this pattern, and then use this one to cut... 
By the time you get to the end, you'll be two inches longer than you started out. You always go by the pattern, and Jesus is our pattern, and we need to follow Him and follow Him completely. Now next, let's look at, I want you to notice that, that when He made the call, when he told them what it meant to follow him, they already knew what it meant. But I want you to look at their response. It said immediately. They did Here's what I didn't hear in that. Let me finish getting these nets cleaned up. Let me help dad get the boat prepared for tomorrow. Let me count the fi- let me get these fish to market first. It says they immediately left. Now, I don't know if Zebedee had anybody else to help him. Or if Zebedee had to finish those nets by himself. I don't know. But he said let the dead bury their dead. Let the fishermen get the fish in. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do when you have family. It's a hard thing to do when you have a a job that you, you know. But Jesus says, follow me. But you know, he's never asked me to do anything that put me in, my family in jeopardy. But some I know he has. But we need to be willing. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared to put him first in whatever. Whatever we do, whatever, whatever comes, we need to be willing and ready to put him first because that's what the disciples did. They didn't hesitate. They left everything and followed Jesus. Matthew chapter 10 gives us a list here. It says in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 10, it says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Now the names of the twelve apostles, notice here, it changes. When he called his twelve disciples, and then it says the names of the twelve apostles. You see, the apostles were the close-knit, tied-in group who had spent personal time with Jesus. He had a lot of disciples. He had a lot of people that followed him. We had a lot of people that, that, that were that, and we could all be disciples. But to those he gave the power over unclean spirits and he gave them to cast out spirits and he gave them the the power to heal sicknesses. Those are the ones who became his apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. And James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. You ever think of that? Judas was given power to heal the sick. Judas was given power over unclean spirits, and yet he still failed him. So even though we are called to be disciples, And even though we become a disciple of Jesus, there's still, we have to remember, there's still sin out there. We can be a disciple and still have to fight against the the devil. Fight against the, the, the things that tempt us. Because even one who is given this great power still failed to it. Folks, we have a lot to live up to. And we need to learn to follow Jesus fully and wholly in our life to be known as a disciple. Now the question is, is what is your response? What do you, how do you respond to the call? Now, there may be some here this morning who has been feeling the call. 
There may be some here who has never made a profession. There may be some here who's, who has never accepted Jesus as their Savior. You've heard about Him. You've learned about Him. You may have even made a profession at some point, but you've never truly given yourself to Him. Is He calling? You see, the thing is, is when He calls, He may not call again. And if you're feeling a call, if you feel the Holy Spirit is calling you, drawing you, telling you to come and follow Him, the best thing to do is do it immediately. Don't wait because he may not call again. You think that if, if John and James and John had been out there and they said, Well, let us let us let's get let's get us our affairs in order. Let me let me have my fun, let me do my thing. You think Jesus would ever come back around to their boat? Folks, you may not get the call again. If you're here this morning and you know the Spirit is calling you, then I I invite you to come this morning. But maybe you're here and you've been, you've been calling yourself a Christian for 50 years. Maybe you were baptized. Maybe you have full salvation and you know it. But you've never really put Him first. You've never really took the steps to become a disciple. Just being called a Christian, just having that fire insurance was enough for you question is is how do you respond to the call to follow me and be my disciple that's the answer that's the question that everybody has to answer for themselves so this morning that is your question as matthew comes as yahia comes let us all stand or we come to you this morning and we thank you we thank you for the life that you lived. We thank you for the, the, the example that you lived out for us. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you most of all, Lord, for dying on the cross and giving us that opportunity for salvation. But Lord, we also thank you for the opportunity to be more than just someone who calls themselves a Christian. But Lord, that you give us the opportunity to follow you, to know you in a deeper way. Lord, if there's anyone here today that needs that, I pray that they would, you would just draw them, give them that call. In your name we pray. Amen.